Okay, um, uh, who am I? Uh, most of you probably don't know me. Um, thank you, Pierre, for the introduction. Um, uh, just some stuff I've done in the past, because this was long enough, everybody's forgotten about it. Uh, this was Swarm, this was a fleet of, um, uh, of uh, uh, autonomous um, uh, rolling robots, uh, kinetic uh, piece. They kind of flock together and work together. Um, uh, this is my friend Chassis. Uh, I did this with an artist named Al Honig. It's a, um, uh, it's a beer serving robot. It rolls around, it will serve you beer. Um, but let's get into the substance of tonight's talk. And I'm not actually going to talk about my work at Pier 9 because I'm not done yet. Um, uh, and also because there's stuff I want to talk about about this um, particular piece of artwork. And this was, the, was done by my friend uh, Charlie Gadigan, who's a fire artist and a large scale um, metal artist. Um, uh, you may be getting that itchy feeling in the um, soles of your feet that says, oh my gosh, this guy's gonna spend 15 minutes talking about another damn hippie LED installation. And you are exactly right. Um, so so um, uh, uh, bad decision number one, right? If somebody asks you to work on their Burning Man project, run, run. Do not stay around. Um, but anyway, this was a challenging project. Um, uh, uh, go into it a little bit. Um, it's 30 feet high. It's steel. Um, uh, it's 189 um, uh, branches. You can see those kind of candy cane shaped things. Those um, have a lot of LEDs in them. A um, uh, lot of uh, hand work and um, metal smithing went into the sculpture. Um, those are four inch steel pipes uh, making up the body of the tree and think about bending those for a minute because those have kind of got this nice um, uh, curvy thing, very organic. Um, uh, nothing straight, no straight lines. Um, we didn't mock this up in, um, in a 3D model, although we should have. It would have made a lot of stuff easier. We didn't. We just built it. Um, uh, and uh, we, to light it up, there were, um, this was like five years ago, so there weren't a lot of um, uh, affordable LED solutions on the market, um, uh, in particular the addressable LEDs like the WS2811B and whatever you can get now, you, they, they just didn't exist back then. So um, we had a lot of decisions to make and one of the dis decisions we made is to use this um, commodity LED strip. Now this LED strip lights up one color in the whole strip so it's not addressable. Um, that makes life a little bit easier. Um, uh, but uh, basically, these candy canes are all basically one color. Um, you can imagine a thing uh, where uh, you, you could have um, uh, uh, addressable L LED strips in that. It would kind of be a lot more, um, uh, a lot more uh, complicated, but we didn't go there. Um, back in the day, the only, um, uh, really the only addressable LED strip that was affordable was uh, uh, optimized for these color fades and it was really cheesy and damn it I'm putting a giant LED thing at Burning Man not gonna do rainbow fades I have my standards right <laughs> okay um, so LED strip uh, how do we drive them we drove them using DMX using this uh, driver board that was done by um, Celestial Audi audio it's a guy named Jesse Lackey he's over in the East Bay um, they have these um, wonderful boards and that'll drive 32 channels of um, of uh, uh, LEDs, so uh, roughly three, uh, 10 branches, because every, every branch has RGB, RGB um, takes up three channels, so roughly 10 branches would run off this LED. We had an 89 branches, we need um, 18, 19, 20 of these boards, had some spare. So one of the questions was when we were building this, um, this uh, installation, where do we put all the electronics? You know, this is a nice tree, Charlie didn't leave any room for electronics, um, so when you're doing a Burning Man installation, you want to keep the dust out of this stuff, you basically have two choices. You have um, uh, ammo boxes and pelican cases, right? And then Charlie comes to me and he says, Charlie, uh, he says, John, I've got this great, great idea of where to put the electronics. We're going to put it in these stainless steel spheres, right? You can get them from China and they're beautiful. They, they would look like kind of this weird um, high-tech fruit on this tree here. And it's like, Charlie, you've got to be kidding me. Um, how do you make them waterproof? Uh, no, we can't possibly do this. And naturally, we did. Um, uh, if you ever tried to drill um, stainless steel, it's not much softer than the actual tool steel of the drill that you're drilling it with. Um, it's kind of a nightmare, but um, there you can see 
um, uh, one of the spheres, and that has four of those um, those uh, boxes uh, those, for those uh, PCBs in it. Um, uh, and it, uh, each one of those pods drives about 40 of these branches, these candy cane, cane things. And we, we gasketed and sealed it as best we could, but nothing was perfect. Um, so another bad idea, but I think in hindsight, it looks good or better thing. Um, this is the Homebrew DMX interface. You don't have to spend a lot of money on these NTech things. Uh, DMX is just RS485. Um, you can get um, a 75 cent chip, which will generate uh, RS485 from a, a TTL serial. And so basically, uh, these are five um, chips which go to each of the five pods, and each of the five pods drives about 40 branches. Um, uh, and I put these in sockets in case the thing got hit by lightning so far it hasn't, or maybe the metal is just a good conductor, that's a good thing. So here's a Pelican case with the brains of the system back when it was a Burning Man or Raves or things like this. It was a $300 um, uh, 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 netbook that's just doing all the heavy lifting. And here's the power supply. Um, every meter of the LED strip takes about six and a half watts, but we're talking about 500 meters, so we're talking about three kilowatts of, um, of uh, DC power that we need for this thing. Um, uh, those uh, LED strips are not the most um, efficient. They just have dropping resistors. There's no constant current drivers. Um, so uh, five of these Honkin power supplies in a box. Now these power supplies, are all, they're pretty efficient, but they're only 89, 90% efficient. So 10% of 3,000 watts was coming out in heat, and I thought that a box had enough surface area to dissipate it, um, just barely. It got pretty toasty, so in a, in a later installation, we separated this out into, into two boxes. But just um, uh, the idea is that this is an NEMA rated box. Um, it's got a big gasket, it's airtight, you can hose it down, nothing's gonna get in there. Um, the software, okay, so the trouble with doing an installation like this is you can't um, test the hardware until the, um, the superstructure is built. And if you ever worked on a big project like this, when is the hardware built? Basically the night before the truck leaves for the desert, right? So you can't do, test the electronics until it's all up on the tree and everything's plugged together and working. And you can't even test the software until you've got the whole um, electronics set up. Now you can do a simulation, I did a little simulation, stuff like that. Um, but the actual software running this thing is pretty basic, it's just because it's Python hairball. Um, it, uh, uh, there's nothing generative. Um, there is some creative code in this talk, I promise. I'll get there very soon. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> basically, I wanted to have everybody in the group of about 20 or 30 people that was helped fabricating this thing um, be able to contribute to um, the artistic vision of this thing. So I set up this thing where basically uh, it would play back images on the tree by, uh, you would give it an image that you can make in Photoshop or take a picture of something. Um, uh, it would rescale the uh, image to 189 pixels wide and there's 189 branches on the tree so every, every basically column of pixels was a branch evolving in time. And then um, just uh, went through a big directory of this and just looped through it and I could interpolate between lines for smoothly varying things. One thing I was really interested in this is, um, is basically staying away from rainbow fades, um, having things evolve smoothly. Um, uh, Charlie wanted a kind of a more natural palette, um, uh, things like that. And it turns out with, um, uh, with LEDs, if you desaturate things, they look really good. They don't have to be all saturated colors. Um, and uh, if you've seen some of James Terrell's later work, he uses LEDs, he makes just gorgeous, uh, masterful work of that. So um, that was definitely an influence. And um, uh, everybody, uh, there was I think three or four people made a couple hundred images, we just cycled through those and those were okay. I apologize, I don't have any video of this thing working, but I just, impossible to capture the colors of this on any equipment I can afford anyway. Um, so this is what the can patterns look like. It's super simple, they're just images. Um, uh, on the left here is a, is a test image and that just, uh, every pixel, you can see the pixels there, every pixel is a branch. It starts, um, and those lines are kind of limbs that come out from the center of the tree. Um, so it starts at the very top row, there's 20 limbs um, and uh, 20 branches are lit, which is the innermost 
branch on every limb, and then it just walks out the branch, and then it goes through red, green, and blue, just kind of as a test pattern. And um, uh, these are some, uh, on the right there, these are some things I just mocked up in um, GIMP, uh, which is a poor man's version of uh, Photoshop, uh, open source. Uh, these are patterns that I made like uh, 20 or 30, and these are the patterns that look best on the tree, and they don't have to be that actually sophisticated um, uh, uh, to give you some nice effects. Okay, so um, that was uh, the first incantation. We took that to a couple raves and things like that. And um, then Charlie got um, a commission um, to put this up in Palo Alto. And by commission, I mean uh, permission to put it up there. And he had to run a Kickstarter to actually get some money uh, to do this. Um, so anyway, Aurora went through a gritty urban reboot. Um, or as gritty as Palo Alto gets, which is not very gritty. A friend of mine likes to call it a seething hotbed of content. Um, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, we put it up there in front of, Hitty, uh, in front of uh, City Hall, and there it is um, uh, sitting there. It's there now. You can go and actually interact with this. And um, in the reboot, one of the things I was really interested in, because it was just, just getting this thing to work, um, uh, the first time around was a challenge enough. You know, there was like 1,200 um, wires on this thing, and every wire had been connected by a volunteer, some of whom who had creative ideas of what connections um, would work like. So just just flipping the power switch on on this thing and not having it go up in smoke, I consider a minor triumph in my life. Um, uh, but I wanted to do a little bit more with some generative stuff, some more creative coding. Um, and uh, so what we did is we kind of re-engineered the stuff to do some um, interaction on your smartphone. Now, you can go to control.auroraPaloAlto.com, and we've kind of gated it um, uh, geographically. You have to be within 500 meters of the tree in downtown Palo Alto to actually do it. Um, you can go there right now. Um, I think it'll lock you out, or if you're smart, you can probably get get around it. Um, so anyway, this has a couple things. You go to the hamburger menu. Um, this is the startup screen. And um, these are these play the patterns um, that, uh, that uh, you saw a couple slides ago. These are the kind of just can things that plays through them. And here's a little slider which controls the interpolation. The smoother it is, the more steps of interpolation it has between um, rows in that uh, image. And so kind of the smoother, more, um, more gentle it looks. Um, but um, uh, uh, I wanted to, to do some interactive stuff, so uh, we also bolted on some uh, generative stuff. Um, here is the actual architecture of how this thing works. Um, here is a server sitting in the cloud somewhere. I'm actually not quite sure where. Um, it runs Apache. Um, that talks to uh, Python WSGI, and then it does a socket over um, SSH to this actual machine. We upgraded to this uh, little um, uh, Ubuntu uh, Intense PC, which is sitting in Palo Alto at the base of the tree generating DMX. There's a bunch of patterns. Um, there's this new generative model, and then it generates DMX, um, squirts it out the serial port to the tree. All right, now um, I just kind of mocked this up, and it's, uh, you know, um, I'm, I don't do this, uh, this is not my area of expertise, I just kind of uh, got something to work. Um, there's probably a million better ways to do this, and some of the professionals in the room can probably tell me, um, or else there isn't a better way to do this, and the entire web is this tissue of um, horrible um, uh, kind of ad hocery. Um, <laughs> uh, please don't tell me that's the case, I like to... Uh, um, uh, preserve my illusions. Anyway, so um, we had some uh, generative stuff um, using these um, uh, user, user selectable palettes. Uh, the generative stuff basically uh, uh, I designed to give you a grayscale thing and you would map that through a palette to get different colors. And so you had kind of two ideas of control. You could either generate a, a palette on the fly using this thing um, and you could um, select the particular algorithm you wanted to use and step through some can palettes and things like this. And this is, uh, this is all stuff you can try if you're ever in Palo Alto. Um, so, uh, uh, some of the generative code, this is stuff I've been wanting to play around with for a while. Um, uh, the, the wave equation, it's a uh, second order partial differential equation. This is a beautiful, beautiful equation, and it's fortunate that I only have a couple minutes to talk about it, because I would totally talk about this all night. Um, uh, so basically, uh, what this simulates is, you can imagine water in a bathtub, what's happening is I'm just kind of rippling the top edge there with this random thing, and then the waves kind of 
propagate. They ripple down um, through the rest of the thing. And you can set boundary equations to have them, them things reflect and things like that. This is a really wonderful thing for generative. Um, it'd be nice to actually do a touch interface where you could actually touch it and splash it and have the ripples propagate out and stuff like that. Didn't get to it. But um, uh, if you are looking for interesting things to do, and this is pretty easy to discretize and simulate, doesn't take much CPU at all, it's all kind of iterative thing. Um, uh, this is something to keep in mind. Um, I love this thing. Um, uh, wave equation. And this, this, uh, uh, this describes a whole bunch of really physical things. The solutions are complex exponentials, which are sinusoids and damped exponentials. Really works a lot like things in the real world work like pendulums and ripples and ponds and things like that. Um, really nice equation. Um, okay. Uh, uh, the cheese ball flame effect, I put that on a grayscale, otherwise it's just too horrible to contemplate. Um, and this is kind of, um, uh, this is uh, one of the earliest um, uh, algorithms, you basically just uh, do a random line at the top and you shift it down and you low pass filter it, you blur it and you just keep doing that iteratively. Super easy, um, uh, came, had some nice effects on the tree, so basically what I would do is I would take a line, um, uh, a couple rows down from the top, feed that to the tree and it would evolve, and evolve over time. What you can do with this, once again, with this perturbation, you could put audio in there, you could put touch in there, you could put all kinds of things in there. I just put random stuff in there just, just to start off with. Um, Quasi-crystals, I love quasi-crystals. They're super, super easy, um, look them up. What they are is they're just sine waves, um, uh, plain sine waves going at different angles and adding and subtracting. And you can get kind of um, all these interesting uh, shapes. Those GIFs aren't looping. I'm sorry, we don't have enough time. Um, oh, there's another one. Yep. Play. All right. Um, so this is my grand plan before I got distracted by shiny objects elsewhere is to kind of put this all this stuff into a framework. Um, and there's even a start of this on um, GitHub. Don't go there. It's this horrible hairball at the moment. Um, but if you think this has value to you, let me know and maybe I'll um, bust my chops and put this together. But um, uh, I like, this is my vision for a, a grand kind of open source framework uh, based on open pixel control, which I didn't have when I was building um, Aurora. I wish I had it. It's done by Ping, Zesty Ping on Twitter. Awesome guy. It's just a nice lightweight protocol for throwing uh, bits at pixels. Um, you can imagine all kinds of uh, hardware ends, fade candy, if you know Micah Scott uh, uh, Scanline, beautiful work, beautiful hardware. DMX, um, you can do software renderers to test your algorithm. Um, I have a couple of those uh, built. Um, uh, the idea is you have these generative things, you have diff uh, different kind of um, algorithms, you have the wave equation, uh, maybe some reaction diffusion stuff. If you want to put in Perlin noise, I'm bored with Perlin noise, but you can put in anything you want to put in there, just, um, just a class and uh, Python class, subclass it. Um, all kinds of things you could put in as these perturbations. Um, you can do uh, spectral analysis in five lines of uh, NumPy. It's gorgeous, stuff like that. Um, uh, so anyway, this was my grand plan. I didn't get very far, but there's a stub on GitHub for all this stuff if I ever get a moment to work on it. Um, so uh, this is actually Charlie at the top of the tree. This is where we are now. You can see how high, how high we are up because there's a person on the ground. And um, uh, basically, uh, Charlie called me up a couple week, weeks ago. This thing had been running for uh, more than a year and a half um, pretty well. And uh, occasionally, you have to go and reboot it and stuff like that. Uh, servers, servers happen. Um, uh, but uh, finally, a couple branches stopped working, and it turned out that um, these uh, things were not completely waterproof, and there was maybe a half an inch of water in the bottom of a couple of these spheres. And what was happening is, in the heat of the daytime, uh, that water would evaporate, and as it got chilly at night, it would condense, it would kind of drip down on the electronics inside. So imagine a little terrarium full of circuit boards, and you get the idea. So anyway, we went, there, we went up there, and I made Charlie take it apart, because uh, if, if this had been a Pelican case, it would have been a lot easier to fix. But um, anyway, we fixed it. It's there. It's working. Um, and uh, happy green blinking lights. And that is the end of my talk. Um, big thanks to all the people who helped me out. There was about 30, 40 people on this project, big project. Um, and uh, let me zip back to the beginning. That's me. Um, if you want to get in touch, ask questions. Um, this concludes my talk. I don't even know how much time I have left. But um, uh, thank you for your attention. I hope that wasn't too boring. Thank you.